Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Courtney Battle, and I have the pleasure of serving as the exec acting executive director of HAND. And I'd like to welcome each of you uh, to today's program, Affordable Housing Outlook and Imagining the Path Forward. Uh, we have a great program planned for you today, discussing the current state of the market, roadblocks, and solutions facing affordable housing practitioners in Maryland and Virginia. As HAND is hearing from its members consistently on the hurdles uh, that they're navigating to address affordable housing, preservation, and production, it's really important to us that we are responsive um, to what's being shared and collaborate with our peers and partners to learn what's working, what's not working, and the programs and policies um, making those solutions possible. So during uh, today's event, we'll hear um, updates at the federal level around bond cap, um, learn from uh, various case studies and hear from a panel of uh, practitioners that are working on the ground, what's been helpful for them um, in meeting our region's uh, very urgent housing needs. And so with that, I'll get us uh, started. And I'd be remiss, last but not least, I'd be remiss if I uh, don't thank our sponsor, Tiber Hudson, Lauren Marcus, and Kent Newman, um, have been amazing, amazing partners to us in the planning of this program and just in general over the years. And we really can't thank you enough for your time and expertise that um, you uh, have shared. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that, I will turn it over uh, to Emily Kadick with the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition. Great. Well, thank you, Courtney. Thank you for having me here today. Um, great to be with all of you. It's certainly an interesting time in Washington, D.C. So we were going to set the stage today with a bit of a um, update on what's happening in policy and specifically as it relates to uh, increasing access to private activity bond cap and to the housing credit, uh, which will hopefully set the stage for the uh, the practitioners discussion afterwards. So while we're pulling up the slides, just want to give you a quick background on who we are. Um, I'm the CEO of the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition. We represent about 260 organizations and businesses that have collectively financed and developed well over half of all affordable housing in the country. We advocate single issue for low income housing tax credit. And uh, as part of that, we've been advocating for more access to uh, bonds so we can increase access to the 4% credit as well. So um, if we can go into the first slide, wanted to just set the stage with uh, where we are in DC with your end legislation, which is literally changing by the minute. Um, I know it doesn't look like there's probably much going on for affordable housing right now, but there is actually quite a bit more uh, than meets the eye. And I hope that everyone comes away with a little bit more of a sense of optimism and, and even better, maybe a sense of wanting to uh, help us get some of these proposals over the finish line that we've been pushing for a while. So, of course, the House is uh, attempting to get back to work after three weeks with no speaker. Um, we do have a new speaker in place. I think, you know, he was a surprise to many in D.C., probably including himself and his family. So rather than coming in with a really set agenda of what he wants to do as speaker, he's been deferring a lot to the committee chairs, which is actually very good for affordable housing because we happen to have a uh, committee chair uh, in Jason Smith who oversees the House Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over uh, loan housing tax credit and bonds who's actually very favorable to both programs and is a big departure from the lead Republican on the committee in the past. So we're we're in a good place uh, right off the bat. You know, the more the new speaker defers to, to the chairman, the better. Uh, but of course, you know, before anything can happen related to tax, they have to figure out how to fund the government. Uh, the funding is expiring on the 17th. We are just a few days away. They currently have no plan to do it. Uh, shutdown remains possible. They've been talking about a lot of different ways they can do this. Of course, the most obvious is just a clean continuing resolution like we see all the time. But the uh, the right flank is not content with that. And so even if they do end up defaulting to that, it'll probably be closer to the deadline just so it looks like they made an effort to try some other things. So we uh, are once again finding ourselves in suspense over whether our government will remain funded uh, beyond the 17th. But Despite that, there is actually a lot of optimism about getting a tax bill done this year, and that's for a few reasons. One, there wasn't the tax bill that we all expected last year, which would have extended expired tax, tax provisions. There's the one related to the low-income housing tax credit. We got a 12.5% allocation increase in 2018 that expired at the end of 2021. 
not for lack of support, there just hasn't been a tax extender bill. But there's all these other tax issues that are still unresolved from last year, and there's a lot of pressure. And one dynamic that's really different is at the end of last year, one, one of the dynamics that tanked a tax bill was there was the Republican ask, which is the research and development and other business tax credit extensions. And there's the Democratic ask, which is a child tax credit extension and expansion. Last year, Republicans were asking for about $70, $80 billion worth on their side, and Democrats were asking for a few hundred billion dollars on their side. And uh, in my view, overestimated the willingness of Republicans to come to the table just so they could get the business extensions. So a deal really never got off the ground. Negotiations never really got underway. Um, now, some of you may have seen reports, they are talking about a tax bill pretty seriously. Um, Democrats have come down quite a bit on their ask. They're under $100 billion on child tax credit. So the two sides are talking. And the reason all of this matters for affordable housing is we need an engine for a tax bill in order to attach anything on affordable housing. Of course, we'd love it if affordable housing was the driver, but it's not. And so we need a, a broader tax bill to come together, and then we can attach provisions from the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, which we'll get to in a minute. So, you know, a tax bill, they are talking, they're talking seriously, we're getting requests about, you know, how we would, you know, phrase the language on some of these things, like lowering the 50% test on bond financing needed to get your 4% credits. Very good sign. Um, there's a lot of hills to climb before a tax bill and anything containing those proposals get signed into law. But we are, I can confidently say we are in a better spot right now than we were at this time last year. And so there's going to be a lot of ups and downs, but we definitely, um, even if it looks bleak in DC, can't be taking our foot off the gas on the advocacy. So if they come together with a tax bill, it could be attached to any of a number of things, most likely as one of these uh, government funding bills, assuming they kick the can next week, you know, whether it's December, whether it's January, there's probably going to be a lot of legislation that gets done around whatever the new deadline is. And so that's where we're hoping to include something. There's other pieces like there's an FAA reauthorization, farm bill reauthorization, a few other cats and dogs that need to happen. So what we're trying to do is just position our priorities for really anything that is coming together. And then um, when these things, as you've probably seen, whenever there is an agreement, things move very quickly. And that is not the time to be calling your member of Congress. That, that's when you know your work needs to be done. And so we're just getting ready for that moment. Part of the reason we feel the urgency is not only the growing affordable housing need, but the fact that 2024 is generally not expected to be a year for much legislation. It's an election year. As soon as Congress finishes its must-pass business for the year, they're gonna be spending as much time in their home states and districts as possible. And that's not the year for major tax bills. So if we don't get some of these things done next year, it's probably not until 2025. Everyone does think there will be a big tax bill in 25. That's when a lot of the um, tax reform, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, expirations happen. So no matter who's in charge and who has you know control of which chambers in the White House, there almost certainly will be a tax bill in 2025. But we don't want to wait until then to get some of these things done. So let's talk about... Um, on the next slide, what specifically we are looking to accomplish. Now, we have a very long, nearly 30 provision bill on the low income housing tax credit. We'd love to see it all passed. Unfortunately, that's just not in the cards with our current political reality. And so we've been focusing on two main pieces that are both popular and viable and have the biggest impact of anything in the bill. And those are restoring that 12.5% allocation increase that I mentioned. Um, that one is the cleanest case to make from an advocacy perspective because it's already been enacted with bipartisan support and it expired. And if we're talking about extending all these expired tax provisions, this is an, an easy one gets our foot in the door. The other one, which has a much bigger impact on production and is a, a, a new policy, but obviously very important, is lowering the 50% bond financing test on the amount of bonds you need in order to get your 4% credits. Uh, the 50% threshold is arbitrary. It's become increasingly problematic over time, not only because of cost overruns, but also because so many states are using up their bond cap. And so what we'd like to do is lower this threshold so that states can essentially finance twice as much affordable housing with the same amount of bond cap 
or use it for whatever other priorities the states are using their private activity bonds for. But it's both a um, removing a barrier to financing and also giving states more flexibility and just more resources to finance affordable housing. Even though there's a lot of other things we'd like to do, if we got just these two done, we get 1.5 million more affordable homes over the next 10 years than are otherwise possible. So on the next slide, thank you to Tiber Hudson and Novogratic for um, this map, which is becoming uh, more and more orange by the day. Um, this is part of the motivation for why lowering the 50% test has become so high on our agenda. And that's because we've got um, over half the states in the country are either oversubscribed or using up all of their bond cap and that number um, may well grow. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this is, you know, this started as a kind of more of a New York, California, Washington, Massachusetts issue. And now you're seeing states like Utah and Kansas and Tennessee and Georgia and Alabama using up their bond cap, which just goes to show how much more we need to really finance all the affordable housing we could be building. But it also uh, is is helpful politically to have states that, you know, have th this isn't all a blue state issue anymore. And so we've been able to get some members of Congress who represent some of these states to not just see this as, you know, a win for Democrats if they were to do something like lower the 50 percent test, but to actually see um, the value for for their own states. So um, very useful information to have. I want to thank uh, Tiber Hudson again. Um, you know, I think seeing we, we do have from some of these states like Alabama, we got our first senator, um, Republican senator from the state to sign on this year. Arkansas senator signed on this year. And, uh, you know, I just don't think these are, um, you know, not a coincidence that the states that are seeing these issues are the ones where we're starting to get some more political support. So let's talk about where we are with political support for this, because I think that one of the uh, the things I encounter often is skepticism that we're going to get anything done, not only because uh, Congress has been so dysfunctional, but they can't agree on anything except for <laughs> this long, complicated bill about the low income housing tax credit. So on the next slide, you can see just a few of the uh, key points. As of this morning, we have 40% uh, of this Congress is signed on to the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats. There's been an effort to add them in bipartisan pairs just so we no one can point to the bill and say this is a democratic priority or a republican priority um so there are actually quite a few democrats who are not reflected in this 40 percent who have expressed their support as well um, who've been in a, a co-sponsor queue so that whenever we add republicans we add democrats as well um but we we wanted to be able to you know cleanly say there are um Actually, it was 182 when I sent these slides in last night. This morning, we now have 140, 184 co-sponsors on the House bill, completely evenly divided between R's and D's. Same thing on the Senate side um, with the 30 uh, Senate co-sponsors. So there's not um, a lot of issues that Congress can find this level of agreement on. In fact, um, I, I have to double check because I know we've been running neck and neck with the research and development credit bill. But last I checked, I think we have actually more bipartisan support than even that, which is a hugely popular provision. So that's you know a testament to many of you who've helped get support for affordable housing and the low income housing tax credit that we have, um, you know, despite the gridlock and the partisanness and the fact that this is a complicated program and a complicated bill that we've been able to get to this level of support. Um, if you go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll go through these pretty quickly, but wanted to flag just who's leading on this issue. You'll see some familiar faces here. Um, it's still Senators Cantwell and Young are leading the charge. Senator Wyden, which is significant because he is the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, which has jurisdiction over the credit. So any any tax bill that comes together is going to, uh, he's, he's going to be writing it and his team is writing it. We're talking to his team often. So having him as a leader on this bill is very significant. And then the new one this year on the Senate side is Senator Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee, who's extremely conservative and I think has helped get some of the new uh, Republican senators who've signed on this year for the first time by by seeing her name on it. So I, I believe not only has she lent her personal support, but I think she's been good for a few others. Um, on the next slide, you'll see our House leaders on the bill. Um, got one from Virginia, Don Byer. So I hope all of you are checking in with him often to thank him for his support and make sure 
uh, you know, he may not even be aware of just how much support the bill has gotten since he put his name on it at you know the beginning and making sure he knows we really have a shot here to do something on affordable housing. Um, but as you can see, even, you know, the fact that we have six original leads on the House bill tells you how much interest there was in showing leadership on affordable housing. So that's something that's new and, and very promising as well. Um, if we can just maybe spend a few more minutes geeking out about co-sponsors um, on the next slide, you can see where our Senate co-sponsors come from. And, you know, in the same vein as the the need to lower the bond cap not being a, a blue state issue anymore. Um, neither is support for this bill. We, we used to have, um, it was a pretty tough time getting, especially some Republican senators from states outside of ones where, um, you know, there's more population density. Like we always did okay with you know, Ohio, places like that, Carolinas. But now we've got uh, both Republican senators from Kansas are signed on. In fact, the entire Kansas congressional delegation is signed on. We have uh, new supporters from Louisiana, Arkansas, Alabama, all Republicans. So we're really making a lot of inroads here. And on the next slide, you can see the um, the House co-sponsors, which uh, as we all know, you know, land doesn't equal votes. So <laughs> some of these big red blocks uh, you know, only represent um, you know, one, one member, but you can see that we've got support all over the country, all different types of states. Uh, all different types of population areas. And it's um, it's this kind of support that I hope everyone takes away to see just how serious it is that we might actually be able to get something done this year because it's there's so much interest in it from all over the country and also all parts of the, polit the political spectrum. So the last point I just wanted to show on the co-sponsors on the next slide is how much uh, how quickly we've been able to build support this year relative to even the last Congress, which we also had a lot of support in. So, you know, right out the gate, we had um, about 66, we had 66 original co-sponsors and got a few more that week. That's a level of support. It took us, you know, 10, 10, 15 weeks to get to in the last Congress. And now we're at 182, actually 84 this morning. Uh, which is, you know, so considerably increased from where we were at this point in the number of weeks after the bill was introduced in the last Congress. So I want everyone to feel like, you know, any time you spend helping us over these next few weeks is not time wasted. This is the most serious affordable housing bill in Congress. We all know that it's going to be a slog on the HUD funding side. If we're going to do anything on affordable housing, if we're going to do anything on bonds this year, it's going to be those two priorities I just mentioned. And we do have a really serious shot. So uh, let's talk about what you can do in Virginia and Maryland specifically. Um, on the next slide, Virginia has been an interesting state. We've got a lot of support. We've got um, some members we'd still like to get on. So you've got Don Beyer. Um, he's he's one of our leads on the bill. Um, Robert Whitman, Republican, signed on right away, which is great. Um, you've got uh, Mark Warner was one of the first senators to sign on to the bill, and he's on the Finance Committee, so that's very helpful. Um, we got a handful of Democrats on the bill. Uh, Tim Kaine has signed on. He's always been supportive. He's one of the Democrats who's waiting to be listed officially when there's a, a Republican added as well. Um, we are still trying to add co-sponsors, and especially on the Republican side, since they don't have to wait to get on and they can bring a Democrat along with them. Jennifer Kiggins is in office. Um, we've had really good conversations with, and we tend to do pretty well with some of the newer members because they can see, you know, when they look at the, you know, 92 colleagues of theirs that have already signed on, it's like they, they can kind of see other members have done the work for them. So uh, if any of you have relationships with um, Congresswoman Kiggins, definitely encourage you to reach out and try to encourage her to get on the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. Um, over in Maryland on the next slide, a little less work to do there because um, there's only one Republican in the congressional delegation. And I don't want to say never, but he is unlikely to sign on um, to the AHCIA. So we've gotten um, you know, the most important members from the delegation signed on, both your senators, including uh, Senator Cardin, who's uh, retiring, but isn't going to, you know, end his tenure without a fight. And he's been a big supporter of affordable housing. But what we're asking them specifically to do, which you can see on the next slide, is for the existing co-sponsors, and as you can see, you have many in your uh, delegations here, 
we're asking them to reach out to leadership with one message, which is we can't let another Congress go by without doing something on affordable housing and specifically the two provisions I mentioned. So we wanna ask them to include lowering the 50% test and extending that 12.5% housing credit allocation increase in any tax bill. And if they start talking with you about, you know, child tax credit, R&D, all this stuff doesn't matter. We're trying to stay out of the politics, above the politics. We've got this bipartisan proposal. There's this need. And we can't let another year go by without getting this done. Because as I mentioned, it's probably going to be another couple of years before we have another opportunity. Meanwhile, since we do probably have a few weeks at least until anything does materialize, we are trying to add more co-sponsors. Whenever it comes down to the wire, if we have 200 co-sponsors, it's better than 184. If we have 186, it's better than 184. So if um, if you've got any connections, especially on the Republican side, where you can help us um, add some more members, that's what we're working on as well. Um, so I'm going to Stop there. I know we have some time for questions at the end, but if you do have any questions about anything, this is, uh, I really just want to emphasize again, kind of our our best shot at actually doing something to increase affordable housing supply. Um, and it's going to be over the next few weeks. This is what we've been preparing for all Congress. So um, I do see a question. Um, does the seemingly 50-50 split among Dems and Republicans include the Democrats being held? Um, no. So we have about a dozen um, a dozen House members who are waiting. So the line for Democrats on the House side is not actually all that long. I think many of the Democrats waiting now will will be added officially soon. The Senate, I mean, it's it's a good problem to have. Almost we have I think um, thirty seven total Senate Democrats have asked to sign on and. Only 15 have been officially added at this point. So um, it's it's been a, uh, we have a lot of support among Senate Dems and so we're trying to hold them off. So if you add them in, um, it's probably, you know, closer to 50% of Congress has signed on, though a lot of Democrats just frankly haven't been asked, especially on the House side, because we know, you know, if, if they're not on a key committee, they're gonna just be kind of sitting there waiting for a while. So, all right, well, so that's the promising part. Um, on the next slide, I'm gonna go to the, the less promising part, which is the HUD funding situation, which I'll talk through quickly. Um, at this point, we, again, we don't know how they're gonna fund the government. And one option is they actually go to conference and negotiate spending bills between the House and Senate versions. Uh, that's gonna be tough. The, the T-HUD bill got pulled from the floor this week because they didn't have the votes. So it's, it's kind of a mess right now but at least wanted to show this chart from Novogratic on the um, the different funding levels proposed. And frankly, for HUD, I think the best case scenario is a continuing resolution because the House is proposing some pretty serious cuts that um, even if you know they come up from the original, it's still going to be a pretty big cut. Some of the accounts we're watching are ones like Home, which is obviously used in a lot of um, gap financing, and the House proposed to cut it by a billion dollars. So um, I won't go through this in too much detail, especially because they, they haven't voted on the T-HUD bill in the House yet, but just wanted to show you what kinds of cuts are being proposed so that as you're watching, you know, whether it ends up being a continuing resolution or a negotiated bill, um, I think, you know, normally we don't root for continuing resolutions because it doesn't take into account the increases in need and additional resources, but in this uh, scenario that might be better than the alternative. Um, I just want to flag two other issues we're watching before I turn it over to the practitioners. Um, on the next slide, this is the biggest development on the regulatory side for, for affordable housing we've seen in a while, which is the new Community Reinvestment Act regulations that just came out um, a couple of weeks ago on October 24th. It's been a multi-year effort among the regulators to modernize Community Reinvestment Act, which uh, is the, the set of regulations by which banks have to invest in the communities that they serve. It was a response to redlining and it's been required for decades, but the actual regulations that implement it haven't been updated since the 90s and the advent of online banking and things like that. So everyone knew they were ripe for reform, but the reason this matters for affordable housing is about 80% of the 
investors in the low income housing tax credit are banks that are motivated by CRA. And even some minor changes to CRA can affect appetite not only to invest period, but even just things like pricing that, you know, that they're willing to pay per credit. And that can, of course, ultimately affect affordable housing production. So I'll, I'll give you the short answer, which is it's going to be a while, but it's a lot it's a lot less bad than it could have been. Um, this the the proposed CRA regulations we saw would have been incredibly damaging. And it's clear that the regulators took a lot of recommendations from us and others in the affordable housing industry to improve upon the proposed regulations. But how that's actually going to shake out for affordable housing investment is going to depend on when the actual bank investors in the program and their CRA uh, officers figure out what it's going to mean for them. So, you know, we can tell you what's in the regulations all day and we can tell you about some improvements. I mean, the the main issue is they eliminated the investment test, which is what encouraged banks to invest in the housing credit because it's an easy way to meet it. Um, the good news is they did create this new um, community development uh, metric and an impact factor, and they increased the weighting of community development activities relative to retail. So that's all that's all better. Uh, we just don't know at the end of the day, you know, how banks are going to interpret that and how it's going to affect their investments. So this is going to be a multi-year process. Um, it doesn't even really go into effect for a few years. So you know, this is something where we're starting to collect um, some recommendations, even though this isn't, this is a final rule. They're not putting out another rule after this. There are going to be FAQs and guidance and things like that. So, you know, to the extent any of you or your partners are observing pieces of the rule that, you know, we could request a clarification, that's something we're starting to put together a list. So I just want to offer an open invitation on that. But um that's something we've been waiting for a long time and now we've got it and it's just, it's time to digest. Um, the final issue I wanted to flag on the next slide is just um, insurance costs, which I'm sure I don't need to tell any uh, one on a, a developer-based call about how much of a problem it's become. Um, what we're trying to do is work to find some solutions that would actually provide relief. One of our challenges is of course, Congress. And you know I spent most of my presentation talking about the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, which has 40% of Congress signed on, and we still can't find, you know, our daylight to actually get it across the finish line, much less taking a new issue like insurance costs. And, you know, most policymakers aren't yet aware of its impact on affordable housing. It's a, it's a thorny problem to solve. And so we don't want to engage in a multi-year lobbying effort to do something here. We, we want to find some solutions where we can get some relief um, sooner than later. So we've got a working group thinking through some options. A lot of them are at the state level since that's where insurance is regulated. Um, one thing that's been helpful that I encourage you all to check out is the National Leased Housing Association just put out um, a survey where they collected responses from about 400 industry groups on what they're seeing. And I think everyone's got their anecdotes on how bad insurance premiums have risen, but being able to synthesize that and use that in our educational efforts with policymakers, I think was a really important first step. So I'm glad to see that. Um, you can see some of the highlights here on the slides, but um, just invite all of you to, you know, be part of this conversation as well on, you know, what we can do to actually get some relief on insurance costs in, in the nearer term. So with that, I think we've gone through um, everything going on right now, <laughs> some good, some bad. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I don't see any others in the, um, the Q&A, but here's my contact info. So if any of you think of anything and want to reach out, or if you are inclined to reach out to your members of Congress to encourage them to get some of these things across the finish line and want to uh, get a little help of who should I send my email to, what should it say, um, please reach out to me. Um, we, we are happy to help. This is what we've been working for um, for years, and we think we have a decent shot in spite of it all. So Hope you all join us and um, not seeing any questions. I will uh, thank Han for inviting me and turn it over to Kent and Lauren to moderate the next piece. Thanks, Emily. You can't, uh, can't turn my video on yet. There we go. If Lauren, yeah, I'm still 
uh, would you guys mind? Oh, there we go. Start my video. Perfect. All right. Perfect. There we go. Excellent. Uh, good to see you. Oh, oh. Hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks, Emily, for that great update. Uh, very exciting on many fronts. We are also optimistic that uh, your great work will uh, be able to get some some good things done, hopefully, by the end of this year or early next year, after we uh, hopefully uh, can keep the uh, the government running. Um, uh, Laura and I are uh, excited to be here as well, as uh, we work with most of you in the industry. Um, we have, Laura and I have a nas nationwide uh bond practice. Uh, this year, we're on track to close almost 250 bond deals around the country. As Emily pointed out, the volume cap map, uh, you know, bond deals, although there's a lot getting done, there's still challenges that everyone faces, including uh, rising interest rates and other factors. So uh, Laura and I are going to run through pretty quickly some case studies in the Maryland and Virginia markets that we've worked on recently. And um, and then we'll uh, going to open it up to our great panelists for some feedback and what they're saying in the uh, various jurisdictions that they're active in. Uh, with that, I'm going to share my screen here and start the show. All right. Can you see that okay? Yep. Uh, so obviously one thing we wanted to uh, highlight, uh, we are attorneys, but we do get in the weeds on the finance side. Uh, we think the the, the finance markets and the, the um, interest rate environment uh, really impacts the executions and debt structures that are viable. Uh, it's not really a one size fits all approach. And as I'll say that as challenges have uh, come up in the last uh, several years with higher interest rates and costs that we're going to talk through many of our panelists, uh, we have started seeing you know some creative ways we've been working with developers and, uh, and on bond deals around the country. Um, wanted to highlight an interesting kind of juxtaposition between it, hope we, we wish these were the, still the rates, but these are rates from actually 2020. Uh, so several years ago, uh, three years ago. Um, and you, you'll see that this is kind of, uh, although very low, uh, on the yield curve, uh, across the board, they are upward sloping and, uh, created a lot of opportunities for certain structures to work well. Uh, now, fast forward to today's rates, you see quite a bit higher, and you see uh, inversion or flat yield curve, where the short end of the curve is actually higher than the, the long end in, in many cases, especially in the first couple of years. So because of that, there's actually been a significant shift in ways deals can get done uh, and, and also opportunities that can exist that developers can take advantage of. Uh, to help at least offset some of the other challenges that are uh, existing in the in the marketplace. Let me put up my questions too. So yeah, feel free to type in any questions as we go through these as well. Um, so with that, uh, that's this is the long end of the curve or the flat uh, the yield curve across the, each term, taxable tax exempts. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out too, you'll see the, um, uh, although tax exempts were uh, lower across the board, uh, back in 2020, then taxables uh, still low. You see the the current structure uh, situation now is that you know taxables are are uh, still higher than tax exempts, but not quite as much. So it's an interesting dynamic that's taking place, especially on the long end of the curve. Um, and this is the short end of the curve. So this is two year tax exempt and taxable interest rates. The blue line. Uh, it's good news is the blue line is below the red line. So that means the interest rate uh, folks are paying on the bonds uh, is lower than the opportunities for investment. So there is some, what people refer to as positive arbitrage, which is a good, at least one of the, again, a good phenomenon in the uh, in the market indicators. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Lauren for our first case Great. study. So let's jump in to see some of these things in practice. Um, first, we wanna bring you a case study from a deal that actually uh, recently closed, um, just 10 days beyond the closing. Uh, closing point. This is a deal um, that closed in Maryland called Park Heights with our friends over at the NHP Foundation. Um, on the left side, we're just giving you a quick overview of sort of the, what this project looked like. Um, this was a 221D4 execution, um, so new construction, ground up new construction. Um, of course, our issuer was Maryland CDA, and this project, when complete, will be located in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, let's take a look at the tax-exempt allocation there, almost $25 million. 
Um, you know, this sort of definitely fires something off in my mind. You know, Emily was just talking about, you know, volume cap scarcity that we're seeing around the country. Um, and also there's a potential um, in Congress for us to potentially lower um, what we call the 50% test to an amount that's slightly lower, potentially 25 to 30% of eligible basis so that we can free up additional volume cap to get um, more deals done. Can't we can go to the next slide. So this was a short-term cashback collateralized transaction. Um, some of our uh, participants here today may be familiar with this moving graphic. Um, on a short-term cash collateralized bond transaction, we're going to see four key players here. We see our trustee, our bondholders, our permanent lender, and our borrower. So at the outset at closing, we're going to see an exchange of funds between our bondholders and the trustee. Um, our bondholders, um, so there's going to be a placement agent that sort of will liaise between the trustee and the bondholders there. So we're going to see the swap of funds. We see our bondholders holding their bond, even though it's really in the electronic form. And then of course, our trustee is holding all those bond proceeds that the bar will be able to access to construct their project. So because these deals are cash collateralized. This means that at all times, the trustee must be holding an amount of cash that is equivalent to the outstanding par amount of the bonds. So in layman's terms, that means that in order for the borrower to access bond proceeds, first, our taxable lender has to fund their dollars into the collateral fund on hand with the trustee, which in turn allows the trustee to release bond proceeds to the borrower. So we're going to continue this process as our borrower is completing construction. This is the shortest construction timeline um, we've ever seen. Um, rapid construction, no delays, no cost overruns there. Um, so at the end, we see our lender just holding one additional um, dollar. Um, because we're fully collateralized at the trustee's level, this permits our lender to go ahead and fund directly to the borrower. Um, that'll be the last thing they need to sort of get them across the finish line. Now um, we've completed our project. So these are um, long-term, or excuse me, short-term bonds, which means that upon placing the project in service and meeting the 50% test, our borrower is actually able to go ahead and redeem those bonds. Um, so this really means, you know, no ongoing issuer fees. The bonds did what they were there to do, which is allow the borrower to meet the 50% test. So our trustee and bondholders have backed out of the picture. And now what we're just left with is our borrower making those debt service payments to their lender on a monthly basis. And we're still seeing, uh, um, you know, taxable debt. It has gone up across the board. Uh, this was FHA 224, which is an integrated construction uh, construction and perm execution. Uh, there are uh, implications for Davis-Bacon. Uh, we have seen the, the uh, queues uh, quite quicker than they had been in the past um, uh, with the higher interest rates. That's one of the other bright sides is that deals are getting done or at least approved a, a little quicker than they were before. Um, and they were able to take advantage of some of the other benefits here. Um, Lauren, any, uh, any highlights on the source and usage? Sure. So I think the first thing I want to highlight is really just the number of sources that we see. I'd say in light of um, construction costs escalating, increases in interest rates, um, the table of sources looks a lot more complex, I'd say, for a lot of folks across the board, no longer just looking at, you know, equity, maybe some GP funding and a mortgage loan. Uh, folks are really sort of utilizing as many sources as they can to help us close these gaps. So obviously, we see a number of soft sources in here, um, you know, in addition to, of course, our bond proceeds and then that taxable mortgage loan, which is what's labeled our lender loan. Also, I wanted to point out that, you know, to some the source and uses probably look um, a little inflated because we have those bond proceeds in a, of about 25 million. Again, those bonds, we show them as a direct source. And then of course, um, a repayment upon tender. They're just there to help us meet our 50% test. I'd say if we can get to a point where of course that 50% test requirement is reduced, of course, we would be able to see issuers um, putting a smaller amount of volume cap into these deals that allows borrowers to sort of check the box on that tax uh, on that test and be sure to claim their tax credits. That's a great point, Lauren. Yeah, that would allow, as Emily pointed out, uh, this TDC on this was really around 50 million. The total sources, as you can see, since we're double counting effectively the $25 million of bonds, Jack you know, uh, increases the uh, the total source and uses, but around 50, 
that's where the $24 million um, comes in to exceed that 50% test. But if it was reduced, I mean, that bond amount could be as little as 13 million and save up 13 million for additional, additional deals. So that's good. All right, so let's sort of just quickly get into some of the benefits associated with using um, this cashback structure. The first being that um, a borrower working with their accountant to take the proper election, what we call a 266 election, they're actually able to factor um, their bond interest through completion into their eligible basis. And that is very key because it serves to help generate additional equity. If we remember back to the prior slide, there was about $22 million of equity that went into this transaction. So we see here on the left, of course, we have our construction loan interest in the amount of about $1.7 million. But then you go ahead and you add that bond interest on top of about $2.6 million. And so on the right side of this graphic, we can see the impact that that had on equity generation. So on this project, um, the borrower was um, really blessed with about $900,000 of additional savings just because of, you know, taking this election. And of course, you know, the doom and gloom theme of the day is that there are plenty of gaps to be filled. Um, so, you know, on the transactions we've been seeing, um, we're sort of reminding folks this is available to them because it will result in that additional equity generation. Yeah, good point. And this is, uh, again, it's been available to do this for a while, but when rates were at 50 basis points or less, when rates were very low, it didn't really have much of an impact. But now that rates are higher across the board, and in many cases, um, especially on the short end of the curve, like this deal, uh, above 5%, it's generating that $2.5 million of extra interest, which is generating a lot more equity. Um, so it's something to keep keep an eye on if you guys are doing or have the opportunity to do or add a cashback structure. It could really help. All right. The next additional benefit, and look at this slide as a teaser because we'll sort of get into this more um, down the road. But the second benefit is that earnings on your bond proceeds actually count towards your 50% test. So what Kent sort of covered earlier is that right now, despite our rising interest rate environment, the short end of our yield curve is inverted, which means that we're able to take bond proceeds and invest them in a taxable investment vehicle at closing. And the earnings on that investment vehicle are greater than the interest costs on the bonds. So essentially, this means that the borrower for the life of those bonds is not having to come out of pocket directly for interest costs on the bonds. Um, so that, of course, is really great. No additional out of pocket costs to the borrower. Um, but again, in light of our environment where folks are sort of, you know, looking for any and all options to sort of make these deals more economical, we were actually reminded that the earnings that are generated using those bond proceeds will allow you um, you can sort of put that towards your 50% test. It may not make the greatest difference, but we're seeing more and more deals that are closing, um, you know, really on, on those thin margins, perhaps being at about 51.5 or 52% of their 50% test. It's almost as, as if they're asking for a supplemental bond issuance to two years down the road. Um, we certainly have worked on a number of supplemental issuances in Maryland and Virginia. This is something that the borrower will just have, you know, in their back pocket going into closing, knowing that there will be some, you know, a little added cushion there um, in the event there are cost overruns over the life of construction. Yeah, that's very good. And so when you're doing this with your accounting firm and running your 50% test, make sure you're packing those in, reach out with the combination of the trustee and the draw schedule, uh, and we can help uh, uh, give you those estimates uh, and uh, actual earnings to help with that calculation. All right, we're going to cover the rest of these case studies pretty quickly. We want to make sure we get plenty of time to our other panelists on the, some really exciting uh, feedback and questions. So what we're going to leverage, the structure that was just done in Maryland, we did in Virginia. Uh, it was a pretty large deal in Northern Virginia, uh, 75, 70, uh, almost $76 million of bonds. It did close a little earlier in the year. Rate, the rate was a little bit lower given that timing. Uh, also a D4. So very same structure. You guys know the cashback structure. A unique thing we were able to do here, though, we wanted to point out, you see the total development cost. Again, it's inflated intentionally because we are double counting. The bonds are swapped out with another source. So keep that in mind. Um, but what we were able to do is they had a tax exempt seller note or sorry, a seller note as part of their capital stack. It's, uh, it's on the left side. You see it's six million dollars right there. Um, so they were already contemplating uh, having that as a seller take back. 
um, we were able to work with bond council in Virginia and the structure that as tax exempt. And what that means is if they were just to do a short term bond deal that Lauren went through, like we did in Maryland, uh, $75 million, 30 months, three, the interest rates were lower at the time, too. They would have generated around $675,000 of earnings above the bond coupon, which would have been positive arbitrage and go back to the IRS. Um, what we were able to work with as a creative way that th they were able to allocate $6 million of the 75, roughly million that they were need and got from the state to a, ta a seller note. And uh, so the total amount of volume cap was identical. The seller note was a long-term uh, instrument and it was uh, uh, allocated volume cap towards it. And by doing that, we were able to blend the yields between the bond, short term bond rate and the long term seller note. Long story short is that interest rate, the blending of the 5% seller note and the 3.4% short term bonds moved the blended yield up to a 4% coupon, which allowed them to retain almost all of the positive earnings. So they were able to now retain 650,000 that was allocated to other eligible project costs. So with a simple adjustment like that, in some of these executions, we're able to figure out ways to create some opportunities and savings in the, again, the higher interest rate environment that we're seeing. Um, the last, uh, another Maryland deal, we closed the Freddie Mac tax exempt loan program. Freddie Tell is very popular. We closed this uh, Park Montgomery transaction with Enterprise uh, at the end of September, so pretty recently. Uh, rate again, rates have gone up. It was just just around six point three percent. Had permanent loan of sixteen million, but needed bonds for thirty million. So we they had a construction loan. It was pretty straightforward. It had a lot of um, efficiencies and good costs. The way that deal works is a pure private placement. So the construction lender funds draws and are used immediately to start building the project. There's no cash collateral in the structure. Very clean and streamlined. Uh, fewer parties involved. And, uh, and some lower upfront costs. And they're paid off at conversion with the firm lender and they sometimes bridge equity, which is very common. Firm lender takes the tax up loan, moves into the first mortgage position and that bond, that tax up loan or bond stays outstanding. And that's, a, that's still, the, the one thing that Freddie offers is a forward rate lock mechanism. So people are, are concerned about interest rate fluctuation, which is valid concern these days. Uh, they were able to lock that in, in some cases, as much as I think three or six months in advance, which is nice. Um, again, to there's there's some construction interest that's included in the basis, and um, that does generate some equity, which is a nice uh, nice feature. And there is no, as I mentioned, it's not a publicly offered or, or privately placed uh, with a placement agent, so there's some cost savings up front. And um, the uh, Maryland, and I know Ed's on the panel, we'll talk to him later, They've been very flexible. In many cases, you might find an equity investor who is related to the um, to the construction lender, and that does impact the way the issuer charges their fees. And Maryland's willing and able to uh, account for that. Uh, that does this structure does allow them to, to actually have a tax exempt loan if they are not related um, in that context. And lastly, we took the Freddie Mac tell structure. And we were able to, we're, we're at, this deal hasn't quite closed yet, but we're working on a very large deal in Virginia that has the same forward takeout, Freddie Mac, $36 million of permanent loan, a large bond deal of almost $90 million and a, and a, and a pretty extensive uh, construction period. And this, this is pretty cool. We were able to uh, adjust this structure to integrate what you saw that Lauren went through with the short-term cashback structure with a Freddie Mac permanent loan. We call it a cash back forward because of that forward commitment. Um, this is a long-term bond deal, like, like the Freddie Mac tell is 18 to 20 years. All the bond proceeds are funded day one, just like a short-term bond deal um, to an initial cash back holder through a bond underwriter replacement agent. The construction lender here, which again might be related to the you know equity investor, uh, which is not uncommon in this particular deal they are. So the loan is taxable already. They fund dollars to the trustee, help build the project. That continues on. They're bridging equity. And upon conversion, this is where the magic happens. The permanent lender, as you know, wants the tax of debt. They come in along with equity to pay off the construction lender. 
And then instead of the short-term bonds being short-term and, and they just are paid off and they are tendered to the perm lender. So the bonds remain outstanding, which is a great feature and really adds some significant benefits in the current marketplace. Because you're saying, well, why would we add a cash collateralized publicly offered piece to a, a private placement? And the reasons are pretty substantial. And again, when the, and these are the source and uses. So again, the larger deal, so you're gonna have some even greater economics. Um, the one thing we're able to do is blend yields. So what this means is similar to what we did on the tax exempt loan, uh, seller note in that Virginia uh, FHA deal, we're able to blend yields between the short-term bond coupon initially and the permanent rate since it's a considered one bond. And it's a lot of graphic pieces that we're happy to go through offline if folks have any questions on this. But by blending yields, we're able, in this case, where interest rates are, even though the spread differential for 4.85% is um, only about 30 basis points higher than the, the short-term bond coupon, it's generating, in this size of a deal, a significant amount of positive earnings of over a million dollars. That would usually go back to the government if it was a short-term only deal, but since it's a long-term deal, those funds will go back to the development team uh, to allocate to good costs. So it's a source that wouldn't otherwise exist. And it's created by the adding the short-term bond structure to the mix. Um, the other piece that Lauren uh, highlighted in a short-term bond deal is unlike just the normal uh, private placement or Freddie Tell, where you're adding just your construction loan to basis, you're also able to add the bond interest to basis, which is almost double, you see on the right side, on the cash back board, it's almost double interest. You're, so you're adding an additional $5 million of equity, which is pretty substantial, as you can imagine. So when you, you do have some costs, you're adding some players to the mix. So that's, in this case, with the larger deal, it could be as high as half a million dollars. But when you factor that into the other savings, this structure, adding a cash collateralized bond piece to the front end of a private placement is creating a five, almost a little over five and a half million dollars of new sources, which is pretty, pretty impressive given the, um, given the marketplace. And as Lauren mentioned, anytime we can pl help plug some gaps, it's, it's a benefit. And then finally, uh, as we discussed, the earnings on the bond proceeds count towards your 50% test. So a lot of developers, you know, are concerned sometimes like Virginia is a little more constrained on volume cap, I think than Maryland, but they, you know, they say, well, this structure is great, but it increases basis, which is true. The good news is that the earnings that are generated on the bond proceeds before they're spent are helping to offset that. So although it does, you'll see this, the earnings are around 6.1 million, we're increasing basis by 14 million. It's a little less than 50% of that. It does cover most of that increased basis. So you're not going back, as long as you have enough cushion going out the, out the gate um, at closing, it is eating into that a little bit, but not substantially. So overall, the benefits can, can clearly be seen here. Um, we did, we just did, we did do a back of the envelope analysis of the Park Montgomery deal. We were able to use this structure. They could have possibly generated around $800,000 of additional sources. So we are working with different groups to see if that can be integrated um, on any really forward private placement type execution. All right, that was a lot of stuff. So uh, feel free to reach out. You got our contact info. Uh, I'm gonna stop the slides so we can, um, get to the, the meat of the of the event of our illustrious panelists join us. All right, everyone's everyone's coming in. Uh why don't we um see I see Stephanie Carmen. Okay, great. Um, why don't we uh, let folks do a quick intro? Uh, I'll hand over Carmen. You are right below me on the screen, so I'll hand it to you if you don't mind doing an intro, so folks and we can go around the horn real quick. Hi, Carmen Romero, uh, CEO at AFA, uh, doing work uh, across the region. So the Arlington part of our name is a little bit of a misnomer. <laughs> uh, Brett. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brett McLeod. I'm an executive director in the Community Development Banking Group at J.P. Morgan Chase, and cover the Mid-Atlantic, Pennsylvania through the Carolinas, focused on the debt side of affordable housing transactions. Thanks, Brett. Uh, Stephanie. 
Uh, I'm Stephanie Flanders, and I'm the director of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program at Virginia Housing. Thank you. Uh, Robert? Yeah, Robert Goldman, uh, president of MHP. And last but not least, Ed. Yes, I'm Ed Barnett, uh, director of rental lending at DHCD in Maryland. Excellent. So uh, we're going to go through uh, some some questions for our, our great panelists here. Just so you know, we got two developers and uh, two uh, two issuers and the lender to kind of get different perspectives in the marketplace. Uh, Lauren, I'll hand it over to you. Sure. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start off. Question for our developers. Somewhat of a loaded question, um, but really, you know, just wanted to jump right in. Um, I'd say with all of the headwinds facing the industry, um, sort of the volatility in the market, um, if you could just please share with us, you know, what's been the greatest challenge um, for your organization, um, really, since we've started seeing these uh, changes in the market? Uh, Carmen, you want to yourself yeah. with that? Um, I'd say... Our greatest challenge is, you know, we went from serving one jurisdiction four years ago to, to now being in five and having, you know, large growth targets. We're trying to go from 2,300 units today to 7,500 in five years because of the need in the region for housing. We want to step up. So we've added staff from like 22 to 53 now over the course of the last two years, a lot of them in the real estate area to be prepared for this moment. And we feel like we got affordable housing, political leadership throughout the DMV. Um, so that's all super exciting. And then about a year ago, I had my first deal kind of hit the, the bond cap um, issue. And that's the first time I'd encountered it in Virginia. And then now we've got the other issue, which is gap money that can't keep up with the magnitude of the gap with the interest rate increases, inflationary pressure on um, the deals itself. So, you know, we've closed, we're about, we've closed three deals this year. We're going to close our fourth, that terrifyingly large complex deal that Kent was just talking you through at Dominion Square, which is only half of the baby because it's mm -hmm. actually 16 units. So it goes to 21 story towers times two. So it's really been a year of just, we got to get across the finish line, which we will a month from yesterday is, it's the closing date, but um, it's kind of all hands on deck, but then as I look to the future, you know, knowing that I need to do it all over again next year to get those deals across the finish line, it's just getting harder. And it's frustrating because I feel like housing is finally on the agenda. Um, and it took us so long to get it on the agenda. None of us want to see these, the pipeline and the production stop. Yeah. It's really, really good points, especially like we had a lot of momentum, right. And that's what's propelled us. And now I think, I was just talking about earlier how the um, you know the the tenacity and and just the the ability for folks to be creative and still move forward and close. But to your point, at some point we you know we just need some some things to to all be working in the right direction and and have that support. That's great, Robert. I, I imagine you're seeing similar things in Maryland and elsewhere. Yeah. Want to give us uh, your your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, obviously you know interest rates are just uh, driving us crazy. Uh, you know, for a while, I think construction costs, obviously, as well, though, maybe that's stabilizing a little. Um, yeah, I think what we're seeing, you know, definitely soft costs, you know, I, maybe we were, you know, fortunate there was some, you know, states and, and localities had ARPA money, and they were putting money towards affordable housing, and, and you know, and, and being able to balance the budget and have surpluses, and so... There was sort of, uh, you know, all, all was good, and that was, you know, helping us get deals closed and uh, deal with kind of the beginning parts of the higher interest rates, and then, you know, things had sort of switched. Like in kind of less than a year, Maryland went from, you know, a surplus situation to, you know, what's considered a structural deficit. So a lot of challenges. I think Montgomery County, similar boat, you know, where they just. With federal money going away, kind of uh, put them in a different situation. The other two things I'll just say, I think was alluded to earlier, you know, operating costs, you know, we're just seeing huge increases in insurance, yeah. big increase in, in electricity, uh, things like that. Like when you're, you're, if you have a contract for electricity and you're locked in and then you, you have to do the new contract, you're seeing these kind of big jumps. Uh, and then, you know, we're still, you know, as much as, 
you know, the general public or the general notion is that we're over, you know, COVID and everything's back to normal. The reality is we're not. And many families are still struggling and delinquencies are still higher than they should, you know, pre-COVID. I, I sort of feel like we're kind of halfway back to where we were and, um, but we're not, you know, so there has been improvement uh, and it's sort of like money has dried up for rental assistance. You know, the court systems are slow. And so people are just waiting, you know, for, to take it seriously. So there's sort of a lot of dynamics going on and it's just not, it's, it's putting a lot of pressure on uh, existing uh, buildings. Yeah, no, that's that's great feedback, and I'll switch this up a little bit, Brett. I know we're going to have some conversations about kind of the, the debt, kind of maybe closing deals and kind of the front end. But since you you're seeing deals, not you know you 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 stay with the deals from start to finish and lease up and all the other. Can you give us some insight as to how you're seeing these, like for existing deals, for example, and you know they come in over budget or how how you're kind of seeing people, what the challenges are and maybe how they're trying to work work through those. Yeah, absolutely. And um, in preparing for this panel, I promised to not be the Debbie Downer. So I'm glad <laughs> that uh, Carmen and Rob have mm -hmm. already kind of front loaded the headwinds that we're all dealing with. Um, but I mean, the short answer is time is not our friend right now for construction periods that are taking longer because of cost overruns and issues related to COVID with rising interest rates. Uh, the interest reserve line item in construction budgets is being strained because floating rates are, you know, literally twice as high as they were two years ago. So interest reserves are getting depleted faster than uh, people had anticipated. So it's really trying to figure out how to get deals that are in construction to conversion, but the conversion process is strained because of the economic vacancy issues that Rob was talking about just now. Um, so really from, from the financing side, what we have been doing is extending construction periods in order to get to stabilization. We've been trying to be creative in figuring out how to replenish interest reserves. Um, but I think, you know, in order to not be the Debbie Downer, the the great thing about the industry that we're in is there's a lot of resiliency. There are a lot of super smart people um, with real um, with a, a real mission oriented focus of how to get these affordable housing properties um, built and delivered and operating well. So, uh, you know, I think everyone comes to the table when there are issues, which is the great news and figures out a creative solution and how to deal with all these headwinds. And um, we're seeing all the same things in terms of higher insurance costs, uh, utility costs. We're seeing higher security costs at some of the properties that we're financing. Um, so I think we're all seeing the same issues and we're, we're coming up with creative ways to deal with those issues. Uh, let's see, uh, Stephanie, how from the issuer perspective, um, and maybe if, if for for those that may not be as familiar with with uh, BHDA, you know how how you guys get involved in the deals is both the issuer. I think you also do the credits, and um, you know what you're seeing and and some of the challenges you guys are are facing. Yep. So I I'm the director of the tax credit program. We also have a rental housing development side, which handles um, the financing and the bond allocation piece. So I'm obviously more familiar with the credit credit side. Um, and what we're seeing, you know, it's it's a lot of the timing, the timing issues. Um, these deals are taking just so much longer to get completed. They're coming in, you know, not ready because they're trying to get in line for their bond cap allocation. I'm um, just throwing anything in to see if it sticks. Uh, <laughs> and so we're, we're having to kind of weed through very incomplete hmm. you know, applications that just aren't ready. Um, and it's kind of a logistical nightmare because we do refreshes for for nines um, and we will do like re-reviews of four percent applications that want additional credits you know after they submit they realize the costs have gone up so we are reviewing multiple iterations for the same deal uh, which is it slows down the review process on our side so those are some of the things that we're seeing just trying to get to a complete application and not take too long uh, so deals can get in line 
And then just you know, the size of requests that we're seeing. So, I mean, they're at a magnitude that we've never seen before. Um, you know, the 4% are coming in at 80 million uh, in bond cap allocation requests. And yet you know, the credit request is over 6 million, which <laughs> that's that big scary deal that we were talking about earlier. You know, it was over 6 million, which before that, the largest credit request we had ever seen was three. So I mean, we're, yeah, the requests are just significantly going up. So uh, we hadn't really planned for for requests that large. So we're having to kind of go back and look at our processes and how we do things. Um, it, it, yeah, and I think uh, and certainly as Carmen alluded to that the demand for uh, the need for affordable housing has surpassed by far and, you know, its costs have gone up. It's just exploding so quickly. It has taken people, you know, by surprise, I think a little bit who weren't prepared for it or seeing this kind of tsunami of need coming um, yes. over the past, you know, many years now. Ed, I know you uh, you guys are very busy at Maryland CDA and have a lot of great tools that you try to help deploy, but what are, what are some of the challenges you've seen uh, in, the, in the industry? Yeah, just like some of the other speakers, um, the challenges really are on operating costs. Um, you know, you mentioned utilities, and uh, but taxes and salaries during operating phases are really become an issue. I think uh, Rob is nodding his head because that that's, that's a challenge down the road, um, and sometimes it's not planned well up front, and so we're we're trying to plan well to see how the operating costs for projects will actually pan out. Um, the other challenge that we're finding is that um, although uh, some people say that the uh, state of Maryland is not uh, volume cap uh, constrained, we are constrained. We, we manage it well, um, and because we, we think we manage it well, we're seeing more volume. Um, people are, developers are finding a way to do deals without subordinate financing, which means you know, we, we get an application every couple of days or so, uh, it seems, uh, for for 4% bond uh, uh, transactions. And so the volume is very, very high, much higher than it's been in, in the last three or four years. And so that, that's a challenge for staff. Um, but it's also a challenge uh, for the state of Maryland, because in, in addition to those deals, there are applications that are looking for sub subordinate financing. And as you know, most states are constrained in that way in terms of having subordinate funds in order to fill the volume of deals and the need that we have across the country. So we're faced with those issues as well. Okay, so we started off uh, with a little of the, the challenges. Um, we're going to get to some, hopefully, some more optimistic and, and solutions. Um, Carmen, you mentioned you know hiring staff, uh, ramping up your team, and and really working with creative folks like you know like Brett on the lending side, and really putting together a a, a team of folks that probably are um, able to kind of figure out creative ways to take a new new approach or a different approach, and just do what's needed to get the, the deal across the finish line. Any other kind of solutions you've seen that have really helped your organization weather some of these these challenges? Um, I think we're, I'm trying to spend a lot of time kind of in national conversations with other nonprofits like California and in Seattle and in different regions to see like what, what tools do they have that we can learn from? And I heard two this week at a meeting I, I was at that I was think would be helpful in this region. Um, California just had legislation passed statewide that the governor signed into law which allows faith-based organizations as well as colleges to create affordable housing as a buy right. So no changes to general land use plan, no rezonings. I mean, it takes us sometimes three to five years to get a zoning done where we're carrying to get a, a process like that through about a million dollars of pre-development on our balance sheet for many, many years, really at risk before we can even apply to Stephanie for a tax credit allocation, right? A tool like that, and I think they quantified to the Turner Center in Berkeley the impact on the amount of density that was unlocked by that. That took years in the making, but I think we need something like that. And the other thing, you know, the magnitude of the gap funding that you're seeing in Seattle, they just had a bond referendum for a billion dollars of gap funding in Seattle that passed two nights ago. And the polling was just there. People understand that we have a crisis, so we can't fund the gaps at the local level the way we've done it before to meet meet the actual need, right? It's sized in a way that we'll never get out of this and get ahead of it. So I, I think, you know, the, the West Coast is, you know, they, they've got different issues with homelessness, 
right? And maybe that's why now they're trying to solve it after it's right. kind of gotten out of hand. Like, I'd like to see our region get ahead of it. What happens if you invest that money up front when you're not then trying to take people who've been chronically homeless and build a housing later? And so those are solutions that, that I'd love to be part of. No, that's that's great. Uh, Robert, anything you guys have uh, seen really try to help your organization? Yeah, well, I I agree with Carmen. It you know we've been very engaged in advocacy, you know, because we're not you know we're not just can't be same old same old business as usual. We're you know first we were in the pandemic, and that needed a lot of advocacy, and, and you know and hats off to you know at least to the folks uh, on the Maryland side, and I'm sure Virginia is similar, but a lot of communication. They you know they listened to what we had to say and. As all these things kind of was transforming, uh, we had to kind of communicate that because otherwise, you know, when you, you don't, no one's paying the rent, you know, you're, you, you've got some real issues, right? So, uh, you know, so, uh, and I think that's been helpful as we're pulling out of that to kind of have that continued communication and advocacy um, to, to deal, you know, with kind of the broader issues that Carmen kind of has talked about. And so I think you know, we're, uh, I was going to talk about it a little later, but I mean, one thing, you know, we've, for example, in, in Montgomery County got by right pilots established. So there's no question marks about like, are you going to get a, a full pilot or not get a full pilot? So that is very helpful. And we've been, we're working now on sort of the right of first refusal that would give us the opportunity to preserve important uh, affordable housing that would otherwise uh, be lost. So I, I think advocacy is important. Last thing I'll mention, and it sort of cuts two ways, uh, you know, the energy, um, you know, a lot of talk about energy and the sustainability. So on the on the front end, creates a challenge because we now have some additional costs uh, that we didn't have before. But I think through the Inflation Reduction Act and other pots of sort of energy money is actually opening up opportunities because we are, you know, whether we like it or not, we are doing energy efficiency stuff, right? And uh, and that has costs. And and so that should be able to be kind of reimbursed uh, through various energy uh, programs. So there are some, you know, I think some opportunities here to address some of our challenges. Oh, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, Stephanie, Ed, I know as you guys, we've been talking about, let's really, for a short period of time, chat about the 50% test. And I don't know, Stephanie, if, you, if you're monitoring this specifically in your shop or or the other side of the house, but uh, obviously the 50% test is still around. Uh, we're all hoping that it does uh, get adjusted at some point soon. Um, how have you guys uh, seen that in your particular states and uh, any policies you put in place or how you're kind of navigating it um, You know, in the, in the current market where these larger deals are coming in and, and, uh, and more more in, in larger droves. Um, Ed, I'll start with you. Sure. So um, I'm sure, uh, like Maryland, uh, we kind of monitor that 50% test um, using a smaller cushion, 53% of land and bases to figure out um, what that amount needs to be. Um, the other part of that is, you know, uh, I think in the state of Maryland, we have fewer issuers uh, than maybe some other states. And so um, DACD gets the lion's share of volume cap across the state. And and of course, like any other state, you know, we would allocate some of that to single family and a balance to multifamily. Um, I, I don't know what these tools are, but there are a lot of tools within single family side, which uh, we uh, try our best to take advantage of all those tools, uh, because taking advantage of those tools allows us to have more volume cap available to multifamily deals. And so that's been our somewhat savings grant grace. Um, so although we, um, you know, I think see folks see us as not constraint. Um, and so that's why we're getting all the volume. Um, so we're, we're very, very careful about that 50% test. And, you know, one of the things that we do do, if you have 80, 20 deals, um, we're not issuing bonds on that 80%. We'll just issue bonds on the 20% of the affordable units because otherwise we're wasting volume cap in that way. And so we're, we're very careful about that. Um, I'm, I'm assuming Mar uh, Virginia does something similar to this. Yeah, Stephanie, you have any thoughts? Yeah, so in Virginia, you know, DHCD gets 55% of the bond cap and Virginia Housing gets 45%. Um, so on our side, you know, we're limiting it to 55%. 
you can't have more than that. Um, but what we realized was happening was over at DHCD, they don't typically get a full budget. So they weren't really calculating the 50% test uh, before they allocated. So we have been uh, collaborating with them to kind of educate them on the 50% test. And they are proposing um, in their new updated program guidelines to start limiting that to between 52 and 55%, which we felt like was a win for us to you know, get through to them. Before I uh, pass over Lauren for the next question, are either you guys um, have up and running a recycled program yet, or is that something you just still explore? We do not. No. Okay. Ed, do you know? I don't. Um, I, I believe we are doing recycled, but I'm not up on exactly. Okay. How much and that just for folks that are familiar, it's a it allows for bonds that are tendered within four years of the date of issuance to be redeployed to new multifamily deals, but they do not come with tax credits. So it will not impact in any way a 50% issue. What it would uh, potentially help address that is to your point of 80-20s, where if they could support more debt for the non light tech units, then you could potentially redeploy them towards those deals and not, not have them have to do uh, taxable. But nevertheless, it is a slightly more complicated uh, undertaking. Uh, we're trying to work with folks like Emily and others to get that program even more streamlined, but it does take some congressional work so and uh, Kent just yeah. be before yeah, we move like, on but, to yeah. pick up on something that Ed said I think there's a trend in the industry moving towards mixed income uh -huh. and using the bond allocation only for the affordable component obviously adds complexity to the transaction and the financing structure but it's a space I think that more lenders and investors are getting comfortable with um, I think the investor pool is much smaller on mixed income deals, but there there is a very active biotech investor um, pool out there that are interested in mixed income deals. You know, there's ground floor retail, whether it's a subdivision by air rights or condo, a market rate component, an affordable component. Um, so these types of deals, I think, are becoming uh, more common and I think the financing structures um, are more complicated, but but again, it's a, an area that developers, lenders, investors have been getting more comfortable with and have come up with creative solutions on how to uh, minimize the amount of bond allocation that's needed in order to create mixed income housing, which I think Great. is a really positive trend. Great point. I, before we move on, I actually have a follow-up question, you know, for Stephanie. So Stephanie, you know, I hear you talking about um, obviously, you know, financial constraints, you know, at your shop, but also just um, the, the people constraints, you know, the capacity to deal with all this volume. I know that, um, you know, in other jurisdictions, for example, we've seen certain issuers sort of impose like, you know, a shovel readiness test. So instead of being able to come to me with, you know, or resubmit your application five, 10 times, um, you know, you get sort of this one shot to sort of check all the boxes. So I'm wondering if maybe your team has considered um, an approach similar to that. And same with you, Edward. Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned that. So starting uh, January 1st, 2024, uh, uh -oh. we're going from a rolling, yeah. So we've always had a rolling basis um, mm -hmm. application. And so we are starting to implement, we're going to have two 4% application deadlines. There's going to be one in January and one in July. Um, and if you don't submit a complete application in January, you're actually going to get disqualified. You have to come back in the July round. And so that's how we're going to hopefully get to more complete applications. Okay. You heard, it, you heard it here first. Heard it here first. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> We're very excited about it, yes. Because the re-review of applications, it is just, we don't have the staff. We have three allocation officers reviewing applications, and we're getting 44% apps. And yeah, we had to do something. Understood. Sure. Well, for the state of Maryland, we, we are still doing rolling applications uh, for our 4% bond deal. Um, we beefed up our staff um, in the last six, eight months, I guess now. Um, and so we have more underwriters uh, working, three teams of underwriters um, with three people on each team, plus some outside counsel, outside, excuse me, underwriters working with us. So, you know, in order to deal with that volume, we've increased that, but uh, no thought of, of uh, sort of doing um, you know, separate rounds of bond allocations. Um, we'll, we'll do it on a rolling basis going forward. All right. Great. Thank you. Now I want to go ahead and kick it back over to um, the developers. 
online here with us. Obviously, we're no stranger to, you know, rising interest rates, you know, other certain challenges that have come about in the last few years. We're really just wanting to know more about what you've been doing to sort of address your funding gaps. Um, you know, we're sort of aware of, you know, what's out there in the universe, you know, nationwide, but, you know, just curious about what success you sort of, um, you know, face, whether it be with state tax credit programs, utilizing ARPA funds, um, or perhaps even real estate tax abatements that sort of, you know, work in your favor. So maybe Carmen, if you could speak to that first. Yeah, I think we really have used all of the above this year. Um, certainly uh, the state tax credit program, we closed our first DC deal, which which had an element of that this year, which was exciting. Um, in Maryland, uh, we did an acquisition where we are uh, utilizing the uh, uh, real estate tax abatement, which is very exciting because it's an acquisition that um, of 170 units that can be it's entitled for over 1,800 units down the road. But it was a way for us to um, increase our borrowing capacity during this acquisition phase. So that, that was exciting. Um, we have applied to housing, statewide housing trust funds in Virginia. We have one deal that we closed this year that had a $12 million gap at the beginning of the year, and we got an eight and a half million allocation from the state trust fund. Thank God, um, because that was the last money in to, to push it. And there was a program that Virginia had high E, which is oh, yeah. money that comes through the Reggie program, the energy efficiency program that Virginia has. So that was a big component of it. Um, and lastly, Amazon's Housing Equity Fund has been a funder in this deal that we're closing next month. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, thank, thankfully it was a commitment they've made many years ago, but they stood by it. Um, and I, I, I believe that fund is closed for that first round, but I think I, I wish more corporations did what Amazon did when they came to town by standing up a substantial um, kind of gap funding tool. So if you're on the phone, anyone, any, any big corporations, um, I, I would welcome you all stepping up the way Amazon did there. Thanks, Carmen. Um, what about you, Robert? Yeah, I mean, Carmen touched on a lot of uh, things that were, you know, as well. We obviously been uh, working with Amazon as well and got a uh, very large commitment over, I think, 25 million, more than 25 million uh, for a deal uh, near uh, the um, Purple Line that's uh, coming one day to Maryland, to Montgomery one County, and <laughs> other parts of Maryland. So uh, that was a huge uh, preservation deal. I mentioned sort of the the pilots, uh, automatic pilots. So we've always had pilots, but they um, there was uh, sort of certain uncertainties and for preservation deals, they weren't really giving full pilots. So that was big. Uh, DC has done something that I really, I, I think other jurisdictions really need to explore. And that is uh, the Section 108 program through CDBG. Uh, I don't know enough about it other than, you know, you're getting, uh, you know, they're getting, they got a fairly substantial pot of money uh, to uh, to do deals and and I, it's somewhat of an advanced commitment. I, I don't, again, I don't know all the details, but from what I tell can tell that most jurisdictions would be eligible if they went through probably a lot of paperwork with HUD, but uh, would be eligible for uh, a, a sort of a, a fairly decent pot of money. And given our challenges today, I think we need that extra pot even if it get, even if it means a little less later, I think we need it now because you know because of the interest rates, and so um, I think we need to explore things like that. Uh, and then you know I, I'm going to give a shout out to Maryland, uh, and this isn't a new program, but you know Maryland, you know uh, going back to the O'Malley administration uh, towards the end, uh, put together the Rental Housing Works, which is a sort of a dedicated pot of money for bond deals. Right, bond deals really struggle. They, you know, they're, they're there's a reason not nine percent is bigger than four percent by you know more than half, right? And so that means that four percent deals have gaps, bigger gaps than nine percent deals. And so I think uh, the governor and the state of Maryland and and the future governors have uh, since have seen the wisdom of putting money into bond deals to make them work. And, and, and it was really sold, and I think still is a great recognition that we, we're, we're employing people. This is, this, was a, this is a employment job 
economic development tool. And I think we got to really, as we do our advocacy, we really need to promote that. We're employing people in construction jobs. We're employing people in management jobs. We're, we're spending money, uh, lots of money, and uh, that means jobs. And so we should really, um, many of the market rate deals, you know, they're shutting down. So it's the affordable deals and the affordable stuff is the, it, when, you, when you have a downturn, we're, the, we're one of the few things in town. And if the, if the local jurisdiction can, jurisdictions can see the wisdom in kind of making sure it can happen, we can make these deals happen. So, um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I think that's all I got. No, that's a great, great point. Um, yeah. And speaking of, you know, creativity and, and, uh, you know, we did want to give a shout out to both Maryland and Virginia for being really at the cutting edge for doing twinning deals. You guys were really in the country, um, on the forefront of embracing it, um, you know, scoring points and QAPs. And I know both the, I think Rob and especially, I know Carmen, we've worked on several twinning deals. Um, now that the, you guys, and again, this, Stephanie, I'm not sure you or Ed have the, this, a lot of uh, technical details, but any, um, now the programs have been around for a while. And I know a lot of the awards are, are being, um, uh, are being done for twinning deals, a combined nines and fours, any kind of uh, lessons learned uh, or, or kind of, tidbits or or advice that uh, folks can take as to how to put those together or, or kind of just things to be aware of uh, ed you have any thoughts yeah well i'm i'm gonna make a shout out to virginia because uh, we saw that twinning uh model and said wow this is a way to produce additional housing housing that we did not produce previously um and so the volume of um new housing um, by using the 20 structure and of course looking at how to score points to incentivize the the use of that tool um, has worked very well for the state of Maryland. Um, so thank you, Stephanie and Virginia. Um, and so it worked very well. Um, one, thing, one thing I would say about it, and, and you all may have seen this, um, folks are talking about the 9% deal and how um, you know you have all this excess, base, ex, excess basis, particularly in the state of Maryland because of our limitations on what the credit amount could be. And people are realizing, well, how do I monetize that 9%? Um, uh, basis on a deal. It works well on twinning projects, but of course uh, you have to more than likely be one building in order to take advantage of that. Because you know, if you're monetizing that basis, you're moving units over and uh, to the foreside, and you know it, it's easy to move them in the building than having to create a new building to make it work for you again. Um, so, you know, it's a great tool. Um, it works well for us. It, it's it's uh, been able enabled us to get units, units that we wouldn't have had before. So, yeah, it's, it's just great. We think it's great. So. Ed, before uh, Stephanie chimes in, um, any just high level um, kind of parameters you would recommend? I, I know uh, it's probably not the best fit for, you know, a 50 unit deal, but what, what are you saying in terms of kind of what, what would be kind of a baseline for folks to look at that option? Yeah, and so in Maryland, we we they have to be larger deals. Um, one hundred, uh, we used to have one hundred fifty units. Now one hundred and twenty um, uh, between the nine and the four. So um, it, it's harder. Uh, I mean, as you can imagine, any you know twenty deal, any small bond deal costs more money, and so it doesn't really work so well there. Um, right. And so we thought about you know what would be really the best count, and so um, so we landed where we are today. Okay, great. Uh, Stephanie, what are your uh, feedback on twinnings? Oh, yeah. So uh, so twinning, it's been a learning process uh, for us. So we originally incentivized the program you know, to stretch the nines, but now we're finding that it's being used to stretch the fours instead. Yeah. Um, we've also, in the last couple of rounds, had this interesting phenomena where they come in as nine fours, but then eventually give back the nines and do four fours, uh, which we were not expecting. Um, the twinning, you know, it adds a significant amount of complexity to the deals. And so you know, we are prepared to refresh, so swap, refresh, however y'all phrase it. Um, we, we are refreshing these deals multiple times, usually before they can get done. Um, our legal folks are um, always asking us to remove this incentive when we're looking at QAP updates just because of the complexity around the program. But I think it's it's worked really well. Uh, so I don't think that we can walk it back, but we are moving towards like more strict guidelines on what's allowed. Um, 
you know, we don't have a size requirement, but you know, these deals are a lot easier if they're in separate buildings. And so we are, we are looking for separate buildings. We, you can do one, but we, um, we request like a pre-application meeting if it's going to be a complex one building deal so that we can identify issues ahead of time um, because we have gotten applications where, you know, the owner has gone through the process of submitting the app, but then in the review process, we just, we can't get comfortable with it. You know, like checkerboarding of units and things like that, that we can't accept. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's complex and we get a lot of pushback and they take a lot of time, but I do think that they're um, effective at stretching the credits. Real quick, uh, let's get the next question, but uh, Br Brett, any, uh, any thoughts? I know you've done some twinning deals, any kind of, uh, not a lot to add other than from a construction lending perspective it adds a lot of administrative um oversight you know you have two gc contracts you, you get uh one for the price of two type of thing not to again be debbie downer but just to kind of give the straight dope it it really does it it is two transactions in one and it adds a lot of um just ongoing administrative related issues you know building a building is tough enough with one construction contract to have two or if you're allocating costs in one contract it, it's complicated and it's a great way again to to create more affordable housing and more active in the in the four nine twinning and really complex financing structure but um let's just call it what it is. It's more complicated and it, it takes more people uh, on those deals to get them built and and across the finish line. So before Laura gets to the next question, Carmen, thumbs up or down on your twinning experience? Because you guys are pretty active users. I think to me, it's all about production and then yeah. places like high cost areas, like we have in the DMV where land is precious. I mean, I would literally be leaving probably six stories on the table for all yeah. the fun deals we've done. So I'd rather pay another half million in legal fees yep. and have those units around for 99 years. So to me, the administrative burden is totally worth it from a mission. Start and, I, and yeah, I think you would agree that the scale really helps with that, right? You need, you need scalability. Yeah. And you need guidelines. I mean, it's just, you know, as much as I'd love it to be like, you know, less compliance, I understand why guidelines really are important for all of us. Like, I don't want to make a catastrophic mistake and have the IRS right. question something I've done at the end of the game. So I think, you know, and I think what Maryland and what Virginia is doing to support it and, and put some um, guardrails are, is actually the perfect mix. All right, um, I'll go ahead and jump back in. So I think this this question is really directed um, at our issuer friends on the panel. Um, so I'm sure we're all aware, you know, nationwide there is sort of this, let's call it a healthy tension um, between preservation versus, you know, ground up new construction um, when it comes to, you know, creating and preserving affordable housing. Um, and we know that, uh, you know, we're not going to get to our affordable housing goals, you know, preser you know doing preservation deals only. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, between um, your jurisdictions, are there any sort of policies or, you know, scoring preferences that are in place for preservation versus new construction units? Maybe start with Stephanie. Sure. Um, so, you know, full transparency, like our incentives and scoring preferences favor new construction, you know, production, it's a priority of Virginia's legislation, and in turn, you know, our leadership. Uh, the way that we've been addressing preservation currently, it's a little unconventional. Um, so on a case by case basis, you know, after year 15, we're working with owners to adjust their income and rent set asides so that they can boost cash flow if they come back in to recapitalize. Um, we do hope to implement like a preservation pool um, or a set aside for preservation in future iterations of the QAP. Um, but that's kind of still in the planning, planning phases. Ed, what about you? Yeah, so Lauren, I mean, you you hit it on the head. I mean, it is a healthy tension, uh, <laughs> and, and an uncomfortably healthy tension, uh, I guess, <laughs> um, because you know our underwriting and QAP and guide favors new construction as well, um, um, and so we're trying to be creative, trying to think of ways um, to make preservation 
um, stronger. I'm sure Rob is is listening carefully and saying, oh, "Are you sure?" And I, yeah, I am. Um, but it, it it's a struggle. Um, and it does it does favor new construction. Um, but we try to, you know, you can still score. Um, uh, I think preservation works well, probably better on nine percent deals because you can score points um, some somehow better. Um, but um, new construction is probably, you know, where where we're Thanks headed. Today. Mm. Got it. Got it. All right. I want to quickly get us through the last few questions just because we want to leave some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so <laughs> this next question, um, it sort of makes me laugh just because we received, Ken and I have received so many calls recently about, um, you know, non tech executions. Um, you know, we've sort of, you know, said this again and again, obviously we are really facing, um, you know, volume cap scarcity um, across the board. And, you know, what we've found almost is a, sort of a, a call from issuers for folks to get creative and, you know, fit, you come to us and tell us how you think this deal can get done um, without LIHTC. And of course, you know, that includes 501c3 bonds, governmental and essential function bonds. Um, we've quickly touched on uh, the availability of, you know, recycled volume cap, whether an issuer sort of has that program online. Um, so I'm just curious about, you know, whether uh, and really, let's start with our developers here. Whether your organization sort of have experience with these non tech executions, um, and just sort of let us know about what you're seeing um, as far as other creative ways to get these deals across the finish line without um, tax credits. Maybe Robert, if we could start with you. you yeah, could I don't like there. Have, um, yeah, maybe you should start with Carmen. I don't have a <laughs> lot to. To say, I mean, we've done 501c3 bonds years ago and the county. Um, and so, you know, we're familiar with it and, you know, it can work. Uh, it, you know, I think it's harder today. Um, you know, I, I think what I would refer to is like, you know, we have looked at, for example, and have participated with like the JBG fund, which is sort of, a, you know, and, and they have sort of a 501c3 kind of take out, um, and I, I don't even fully appreciate or understand the concept, but that, you know, to, uh, so, but it is sort of, it starts as a taxable fund, but then uh, kind of gets refinanced into a, a tax exempt uh, and a fu fund or bond uh, execution using 5013 bonds. So that's, I, I guess, the closest. And so, you know, um, and um, yeah, and then, you know, I guess, you know, yeah, in terms of bond, if you're just talking about bonds and government bonds, yeah, for specific deals, it would just, yeah, we're not really use, utilizing, at least for now, uh, in any grand way. Carmen, can you talk to us about your experience? Um, yes, and I would say, you know, we have been sort of shopping with equity providers, especially on the ability to acquire things quickly that we think could be long-term um, New development, like taking a 200 unit building that we know we can entitle over time. So um, I would say that's really where we focus our energies um, and, and then tee those up to be a bond, a tax credit deal down the road with maybe a mixed income component with home ownership that maybe we could find a JV partner. That So that's really where we spend the energy. We, I, I do think we want to research because I've seen this happen on, on the West Coast nonprofits who can get rated and issue their own bonds um, as something that, you know, has been on our work plan for a year now that I think we're going to try to explore next year. I don't know if I missed a window for that. Kent, you would probably tell me, oh, you're nodding your head now. Maybe. I did miss a window. Okay, well, then maybe I... No, no, you're good. I said you're good. You're good. Oh, I'm good. Okay, then it stays on the work plan. But if anyone has a good idea, I, I'm all ears. Yeah, and I imagine Brett uh, kind of goes to kind of capital stacks. Like we do in the in the current industry environment, it's very challenging, especially new construction, to do a deal without. I mean, Litech, you know, we, we all know is such a huge piece of these financings, and even there, it's tough, right? There's still gaps, as as Robert pointed out, four percent credits. It, um, Brett, have you have you been able to get or seen many deals work, and other than some, I think, limited circumstances for non Litech deals in the affordable space? Yeah, I I think. I would be remiss to uh, not mention that we launched a platform called Capital Solutions a couple of years ago, specifically focused on workforce housing. So, you know, 80% to 120 uh, AMI 
which is a really hard financing structure because you don't have the subsidies associated with LIHTC, um, but the rent levels still are, you know, obviously not at market rent. So how do you solve that? And to Carmen's point, we've spent a lot of time reaching out and partnering with equity providers that are mission oriented and are focused on this part of uh, the you know, unmet need, the missing middle, whatever you want to call it, workforce housing, attainable housing, naturally occurring affordable housing. It's a really complicated financing puzzle to, to solve, but it's one that we've been very focused on. Um, in terms of 60% AMI and below, it, it really, you're preserving bond allocation uh, by not having tax exempt bonds associated with it, but you're to Ed's point earlier, to fill the gap, you need subsidy. So, right. you know, if if you're trying to solve for tax exempt bond allocation, but then are using another scarce resource and subsidy from another pot of money, uh, it it's not necessarily solving the issue. So, um, it, it's it's obviously complicated. I wish I had um, a great solution, but. We're, we're seeing all the same things, especially in DC with the tax exempt bond volume cap issues, you know, 501c3 bonds through the deputy mayor's office for planning and economic development, you know, but again, you need sizable uh, right. subsidy. subsidy in the deal right. to make the numbers work. So, right. And, and your cap, you only can support so much debt at some point, right? You're going right. to, like the, the rents aren't able to cover the cost sometimes. So yeah, it is, it's struggle. So a lot of deals, unfortunately, I think are going to be on the sideline that can't pencil until they, you know, some other source comes in or or other uh, adjustments on the interest rate side. Um, before, Brad, we get back to you on kind of how you're viewing newer deals and um, kind of structuring those for trying to build in as much cushion as possible. Um, real quick, if uh, Stephanie and Ed, you guys, I know in Virginia, for example, there's a few ways to do bond deals, as you mentioned, Stephanie, I think. VHD gets the about 50% or so of the volume cap, and then the others go to DHD, which allocates them locally amongst all the IDAs. I think on the local level, you know, most issuers, uh, local issuers are comfortable with various, all, pretty much all different types of structures. Uh, is it still the case for, for the most part that uh, VHD is, has their own lending program? Is that what's being used for most deals? Yes. Yeah, that's true. And uh, we did do a couple of creative things uh, with uh, Carmen's shop, actually, where you guys were able to create a, and I don't know if it's still a, a, a program, but it was a cool, you guys did a takeout, like a perm forward, and we did a local issuance, and that was a nice combo there. But uh, and do you see any sense of uh, things changing or, or expanding outside of just the VHDA loan program? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I know that's on the debt side, so you might be. Ed, you guys have a few more options or kind of um, that the, that CDA offers. Um, real for for the uh, folks that are joining us, you maybe do a quick rundown of what sure. what various executions are, are available. Sure. Yeah. So we have uh, several. Um, um, the most prevalent right now is the risk sharing program. Um, this is the HUD insured uh, loan, um, and the reason because the interest rates are so great uh, under that program. Um, we have a forty year term and then also the seventeen year balloon. Um, that people are taking more advantage of the 17-year balloon because the rates are even lower. Um, so if, uh, if you can't afford to do that, then most folks are trying to do that. Um, Freddie Tell transactions, as you showed earlier in one of the slides, um, we've not seen as many Fannie uh, MTEBs, um, um, although we have done one or two of them in the last year or so. Um, the issue there is that towards the end of the year, um, you know, we realize some folks who may try to do that, they may not have, they may not be the appetite to actually fund those deals at the end of the year. So we look for those earlier in the year if you if you're thinking about that, uh, developers. And then of course the the two twenty one D four is is uh, sort of a standard bearer that's been there for a while with us in the state of Maryland. So. Yep, with short term bonds. Yep, so that's that's mm -hmm. good to hear. I think I think we are may have a few coming up, but um, you guys could do well, long term bonds back back by tax exempt by by FHA as well, which. Yeah, yeah we, we've done those, but not, not in many years, maybe three right. or four years now. So, yeah. Um, all right, Brett, how uh, how are you figuring out how to put all, can you can you guys offer like 100 year AM deal? Uh, yeah. well, yeah, there's already <laughs> no AM. Just teasing, just teasing. In, in what? five year increments. So, <laughs> yeah. Went from 30 um, to how, 35. Uh, how, how are you, you guys 40. being 
yeah, being creative in the uh, in the financing side nowadays with uh, all of the headwinds that we're seeing. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a collective effort, right? I mean, I think the the whole first half of this two hour discussion is from a policy perspective. Uh, people are very active in the advocacy uh, world. Obviously, Kent and Lauren, you all at Tiber Hudson are uh, financial advisors who happen to have law degrees. Um, I, I say that jokingly, but I mean it. Um, and, and I think we all, you know, collectively try to come up with structures that work well, like the APA deal that was in the case study. So, you know, we're all coming to the table saying, what's, what's a way that we can preserve bond allocation and get more eligible basis with cash back forward execution, you know? So, that I think there are a number of uh, ways that we're trying to address the issue. One thing that we're doing at Chase is offering fixed rate construction loans. You know, for a long time in the interest rate environment that we were in, you, you didn't hear anyone asking about interest rate caps or interest rate swaps or fixed rate construction lending. And that's something that we hear on every deal now. How do we manage interest reserve during the construction period? So we're trying to be forward thinking and and a, a good financial partner in that regard um, to have a fixed rate so you don't have to uh, worry about the interest reserve sizing. And, and Rob, I know that we're working with you on a big DC deal where that was something that was important to make the numbers work. So, um, you know, also looking at uh, the construction loan periods and making sure that we're all being realistic about how long it takes to build these projects and get them converted. Um, I think, you know, we learned a lot of hard lessons during COVID um, in terms of construction delay, cost overruns, all the rest of it, and, and taking that and applying it moving forward so that, that it's in all of our interests that the numbers work and that that the interest reserve is sized correctly, that the reserves are sized correctly, that we can collectively work on deals that, you know, convert on time, on budget, and the rest of it. Um, but it's obviously talking about healthy tensions again. It's a healthy tension between subsidy providers and underwriting criteria. So we, as a first mortgage lender, want to make sure that there isn't too much perm loan debt on a project but the subsidy provider wants to make sure that they're not quote unquote over subsidizing the deal. So, you know, there's, there's a healthy tension there to make sure that the subsidy providers are being good stewards and marshals of the subsidy that they're providing into deals. And, and at the same time, making sure that these deals are gonna perform as everyone hopes and expects they will. So, you know, I, I know I didn't offer any concrete solution, but I guess, Fixed rate construction lending is one way to solve some of these headwinds. Um, and again, making sure that when we're underwriting deals, they're not razor thin day one, so that if there are operating expense increases or income is slightly lower than expected, they still perform. So that that's what I would end with. Good stuff. So uh, Lauren's going to uh, wrap up with a couple more questions, but just as a reminder, in the last few minutes, if anyone does have any questions, uh, just use the Q and A uh, box, and I uh, love to answer those. We also um, do have everyone's contact uh, for this, so feel free to reach out. But all right, um, hmm. Look, looking at the time, I think I'd like to ask uh, this this question of the group, somewhat of a loaded question, but you know, in light of the doom and gloom we've discussed, I'd like to end on somewhat of a lighter note. Um, so really, this is a question for everyone, um, and that is, if you had one wish and could make one change in our industry um, that could, you know, positively impact the affordable housing crisis, what would it be? Um, I want to go ahead. I'm just going to go into a circle based on who's on my screen. So let's start with Carmen. Oh, you had to start with me. My mother. <laughs> um, you know, I think what would help us the most is is what really Emily's working on. I mean, I think there we need some relief at the federal level. These are conversations and struggles. Like I said, I'm spending a ton of time in national conversations with my peers. It's the same exact problem. 
right? So I don't know if it's like universal vouchers so that people, you know, we can get the, the right rent so that we can borrow enough um, and that the gaps are there, um, you know, as well as enough tax credit funding to materially increase the program to meet the 7 million homes that we need to develop as a country. Robert, what about you? Uh, yep, I will second Carmen's, but um, I'm going to go in a totally different uh, realm here. And and even though much of what we're talking about is development, I think what I, I think what I come away from the pandemic feeling is that there are just a lot of residents who need rental assistance, and 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 not rental assistance just to take care of their balance. It's ongoing rental assistance. I mean, I think just think there's just to a lot of folks there. And, and and kind of related to that, I also feel like there needs to be some kind of combination of sort of like you, you lost your job or you, you have reduced hours or whatever, you change in circumstance where you get like maybe it's a temporary subsidy for a year or whatever it is. And you, with that comes some wraparound services, employment uh, counseling or what have you. I, I just feel like, and, and so people can get back to, you know, uh, a, a better situation where they don't need the, the subsidy. Uh, so I, I, and so I'm also, we're all related to that, really advocating and come away from the pandemic feeling that we realize that services, place-based services are also very important. You know, people went to a um, vaccine clinic. It, they wouldn't go down the street, even if it was just uh, you know five blocks away. But they would go down downstairs to their apart, you know, the community center in their apartment complex. So we really need to. And we're trying to start this conversation in Montgomery County, and, and maybe other jurisdictions have already done this. But really trying to get this sort of okay, let's continue this effort that we started in the pandemic, and let's branch that out to other services that we can. Bring to, you know, we know where the low income, where a group of the low income people live. They live in our buildings, right? We certify them. We know they're low income, all that. So let's bring the services to where they are and uh, really make an impact on people's lives. So there you go. Thank you. All right, let's jump to Stephanie. Yeah, so my answer is pretty simple. Uh, I would just love to have more credits to allocate. I think it would be fun. I hate saying no to folks. You know, all of these deals are good and you know, you know, all the work and time and money that went into putting the applications together. So I would love more credits. Um, and then just, I would love it if the IRS would extend the placed in service deadline from two to three years, mm -hmm. because I mean, all of the back and forth of refreshes, the credits coming in and out. I mean, that's a risk to the program. So uh, three years would really be nice. Thanks. All right, Edward. Yeah, I mean, back to what Connor was saying, it, it's it's about the work that Emily started uh, in the beginning of this program, but it's it's really about resources. Um, you know, um, you, each of us in each state are constrained by the subordinate financing that we have. Um, more of that, um, you know, I appreciate all the advocacy work that's being done by all the developers and all the community here to make sure that, you know, that we have the resources that we do have. We've been lucky in the state of Maryland. Um, we were able to sort of span the pandemic a little bit with a couple of programs um, um, in order to get deals closed during that time. Um, but now that's spent. And so those resources are needed again. Um, and so I know the budget's coming up, people are fighting and trying to get more money. Well, keep keep the fight up because we do need those resources. Thank you. All right, now Brett, leave us with a, a happy message. Please. Oh, I think Kent already said a hundred year amortization. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go I'm going to go in a different direction than ever to just say more focus on uh, affordable home ownership in order to address the racial wealth equity gap. I think more focus, more resources, more thought going towards home ownership would be something that benefits the affordable housing industry, you know, throughout the country. I agree. Thank you. All right. Well, folks, I think we're at time. I certainly want to thank our amazing panelists for joining us. Um, I know at least during Kent and I's portion, we covered a lot of uh, dense information. So if anyone would like access to those slides, certainly don't be a stranger. Please reach out. Um, you know, 
send those questions. And I think now that we're time, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to Courtney. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, as we prepare to wrap things up, I'd like to thank all of today's speakers for providing such great insight and lending your time uh, to the preparation and execution of today's session. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Tiber Hudson, for their support of today's session. Again, just your partnership in organizing uh, today's event has been amazing. We're so grateful to have such great thought leadership represented within our membership network. And I think I really can speak for our members when I say that our ability to come together, have conversations like this and determine solutions uh, for a way forward it continues to be relevant. Uh, for our members and partners in this space. Also, before we close out, wanted to make sure that I plug a couple items. One is our upcoming alternative financing solutions program. Uh, so stay tuned for a notice in your inbox um, on that event next week. I think it will tie really well to a number of the issues that we touched on today. And two, our holiday mixer uh, will be in early December. You'll also be seeing that announcement very soon. So we hope to see everyone uh, come out for that event. And last but not least, a huge thank you to the HAND team, our program director, Susan Ortiz, and our program associate, Tiana Overton, for their hard work on today's session. And uh, we appreciate everyone who was able to join us today and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thanks all. Have a great week. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good one.